So I have a question for the women that are listening. What is your relationship with Jesus? And what is your relationship with the Bible? And as a woman, I can attest that my relationship with Jesus and the Bible are not the same thing. And if you're a man who's listening, I would encourage you to talk to the women in your life because they might have similar feelings. The Bible was written exclusively by men, largely exploring the lives of men. That doesn't mean that women weren't important, it just kind of is what it is. And because of the time in history that the Bible was written, most of the women are doing something or are described by their relationships. So they're mothers and wives and other caregivers. But if I'm not any of those things, I'm not a wife, I'm not a mother, where does that leave me with the Bible? So I want to take a really quick, quick look at what Jesus has to say about women and their role in his story. And I know it's a very, very big conversation, so this is just a really small snapshot. But to do that, I want to take a look at Mark. Uh, we're going to look at Mark 5, verses 24 to 34. So a large crowd followed and pressed around him. Him is Jesus. And a woman was there who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years. She had suffered a great deal under the care of many doctors and spent all she had. Yet instead of getting better, she grew worse. When she heard about Jesus, she came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak because she thought, if I just touch his clothes, I will be healed. Immediately, her bleeding stopped, and she felt in her body that she was freed from her suffering. At once, Jesus realized that power had gone out of him. He turned around in the crowd and asked, who touched my clothes? You see the people crowding against you, his disciples answered, and yet you can ask, who touched me? But Jesus kept looking around to see who had done it. Then the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came and fell at his feet, trembling with fear, she told him the whole truth. He said to her, daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace and be freed from your suffering. And so this woman was dealing with a distinctly feminine problem. There was not a single author of the Bible nor a single disciple who could possibly understand in full what she was actually going through. And yet, it's something that women universally can relate to, that male readers of scripture can't. So I think we need a little bit more context, though. When we think about menstruation in the Roman Empire and the time that the Bible was written in, it is, it's taboo now, but it was way more taboo then. So if a woman was menstruating, she would not be allowed in any religious spaces. She would be cast out from her society, even from her own family, because she was seen as impure. And that's not just because of a societal norm, that was because of Levitical law. And so for an example, if she were to sit in a chair that, and got up from that chair, that chair would be seen as impure for the rest of the day until sunset. So if somebody came and sat in that chair after her, they would then be considered impure until sunset. And this wasn't just a couple times a month that she was dealing with this, right? She was bleeding for 12 years. That's 12 years cast out from her religious society, like her church. 12 years separated from her family, her spouse, her friends. 12 years being told that she was unclean and impure. And 12 years essentially quarantined, which many of us can relate a little bit to. And so, and this is all on top of any of the physical discomfort that she's experiencing just because it's that time of the month. And on top of the fact that she spent all of her money on this, so now she's in poverty. And yet, this woman who knows religious leaders cannot associate with her at this time. She sees Jesus, who she, see, she sees as a religious leader. She has the audacity to go up and touch his cloak because she believes if she touches him, she will be healed from her suffering. So Jesus, who really is a religious leader, not, not according to the Pharisees, but according to us, um, so he looks at her or looks for her and he doesn't respond with what any of the other religious people of the day would respond with, which was shame. He doesn't scold her. He doesn't shame her. He seeks her out and he calls her to him and honors her faith. And so 
he pauses in his journey to make sure that this woman is recognized in front of everybody there and in front of his disciples who are going to carry on his legacy and his story after he, after he dies on the cross and resurrects. And so I think that this passage is two things. At first, I think it's a reminder that as much as Jesus sees men and elevates them and respects them and honors them, he sees women just the same. He honors them, he elevates their faith, and he respects them, and he makes sure that other people know that that is a priority to him. And I think that it's interesting that we never learn this woman's name. We know she's a woman. We know her economic status, that she has spent all her money, so she's most likely poor. And we also know that she's suffering with chronic illness. And I think that part of the reminder is that Jesus sees all of those people as well, the people that are cast away from society, people yeah. who are marginalized and sent out from the church because they're told yeah. that they are unclean, impure, unworthy yeah. of the love of God and yeah. the community of God. And I also think that this, or this is important to see it's not a one-time thing. Two other times in the book of Mark, once in Mark 1 and once in right after this story in Mark 5, Jesus touches people who are seen again as impure and cast aside. He touches the leper and he touches a corpse, both of which, according to religious law, are unclean and impure and he shouldn't be touching them. But he does because he loves deeper than the law would suggest. I also think this is an invitation. This is an invitation for us to hear that reminder and to look at our own community, look at our circle. Who is it that our instinct tells us is unclean, impure, unworthy? Who is that? There's somebody that comes to mind right now, I'm sure of it, because there are people for me. And it's an invitation to ask in a really cliche, what would, cliche way, what would Jesus do? Not just would he look at them and say hi, but what would he really do? How would he honor and respect and love the people that we would assume he wouldn't want to and we, out of instinct, don't want to ourselves?